<laughs> Alright, we're trying out a microphone tonight, because we're a lot of deaf old guys out here, so we're having a hard time hearing. What? 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 <laughs> Two weeks, then I'll be able to hear what you're saying. I've ordered them. Alright, there we go. Our agenda. Uh, have I got that put up yet? No, I do not. One moment, please. Gee, the wireless screen. Yeah, I know. I know. But I wanted to have Bluetooth app for my phone. Uh, <laughs> all right. First of all, the welcome some of our visitors. I noticed some fresh faces. Fresh faces. Doesn't have to be that one. Pretty good, eh? I'll just have to keep my wrist here and I'll be on there. Just have to start doing this. Uh, Jerry will do our Astro News. Ellen is going to give us uh, a little bit of the Observer's Report, a little bit on the uh, recap on Bayfield, and uh, also uh, uh, the GA. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some upcoming events, and at break, after break rather, uh, Rudy, Clark, and Peter will give us a, uh, a history talk, a talk about Rask history. And there's some good news in that. I'm not sure how much everyone's aware of it, but uh, uh, by the end of the meeting, you'll know all about it. So the first one, I guess we've got some uh, some new folks here. First of all, welcome, all of you. I think, uh, you know, we certainly, this is one of the reasons why we're here, is to uh, uh, welcome folks and help them to get started in uh, what we think is a terrific hobby and uh, and some of the best people I've ever met. So I haven't met too many people apparently. Eh? I don't get out much. That's coming from the skin <laughs> Again, Jerry will talk to us. Ellen, uh, Serge is here. Uh, where's Serge? Serge, are you uh, okay for what's up or? Yeah. Because we've had uh, Carol on the back burner here, so uh, Carol can take the night off. No, no, he can go for it. He can go for it. Okay, we'll let you guys find it out. See who shows up when uh, what's up comes up. Okay, and again, uh, our history story with a KW Rask connection after the break. So I guess Jerry, we're up for you. I have to hold this thing. Yeah. <laughs> No, What's this? <laughs> what? Oh. What? What? <laughs> okay. Um, I probably agreed with 90%, maybe 99% of the decisions made by Barack Obama during his eight years of, uh, of tenure in the, in the White House. But there's one that I did not agree with. And that's when he decided to discontinue NASA's program to go back to the moon. Um, I can still remember his saying, well, why should we go there? We've already been there. And I said, oh, all right, come on, wake up. Anyhow, uh, the personnel in NASA were dispirited and uh, um, disillusioned and so on and so forth. And life went on. And Mr. Trump came in. And Mr. Trump, as you know, one of his, uh, his goals is to discontinue, disassemble, this would disrupt anything that... President Obama did. So guess what? He decided to go back to the moon. <laughs> so good decision. The wrong, the wrong reason, but good decision. And so NASA said, okay, we'll land by 2028. Well, 2028 is pretty far away, and that didn't satisfy uh, Donald, because 2024 might be the last year that he's in office, assuming that he gets reelected. And so guess what? <laughs> NASA is going to land on the moon in 2024, which would be the crowning glory, if you wish, of Donald Trump. So it's the Artemis program, and they're contracting out to a number of private concerns uh, to send spaceships to, um, uh, to the moon. And thus far, four sites have been, have been chosen. And what's interesting is where they are located. Uh, they're all in the north, if we can consider the moon to have the north and south. And probably as far away as possible 
from where we know there is water on the, on the, uh, on, on the moon, as in ice, which is in the South Pole. <clears throat> so uh, the Chinese are going there, and I'm not sure about anybody else. I've heard that India might, might, might go there. It looks like the Americans aren't going to go where there's moon on, 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 sorry, where there's water on the moon anytime soon, but um, we'll see what happens as the whole situation evolves. What's also interesting is look at the sites that they're, they're selecting. They're all in the mares. In other words, where the land, I'm not sure if you can say, use the word land, but where, where the surface is smooth. And NASA was asked at that question, why are you going to those locations? And the answer was, well, landing is the most important thing when you're going to the moon, and we don't want to hit any boulders or wherever else, so we're going where it's as smooth as possible. So um, good luck. Um, and if they land by 2024, um, maybe uh, President Trump will be very happy with that. Anyhow, um, ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. It's a series of 66 telescopes um, on the Atacama Desert, 3,000 meters high. Uh, Jim and I actually uh, tried to go in there a few years ago when we were in San Pedro for, for a week or so. Um, we got as far as this, the opening gate <laughs> and we threw it away. Um, too bad. But anyhow, um, this array of telescopes uh, can generate pictures or images that are 10 times better than Hubble. And they're really going out pretty far. And in doing so, what they've done is they've captured uh, a merging of galaxies that goes back to only a billion years after, um, after the universe was, was, was founded, the Big Bang. Um, most, at one point, and not all that long ago, uh, scientists didn't know that there were galaxies as early as less than a billion years after the Big Bang. Not only did they exist, but they were merging. And so uh, this is just a phenomenal uh, picture on one hand, but also discovery in terms of how, what was going on in the universe very shortly after the Big Bang. Um, so we'll hear more about this as time goes on, but that, that was a, a really uh, amazing discovery. Terry, yes, sir. Do you have a name for that image or that location? Uh, name for it? Alma, A-L-M-A. -A -A. No, 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 Al no, I know Alma, but what's the actual image? What's the actual galaxy, galaxy, galaxy. Oh, uh, no, I don't have a, a okay. name for it. It's just, it, it's as, uh, as uh, recently as possible, and then I don't know that there was an actual picture per se, or an actual description. The sun. Um, I think most of us know that the sun has an 11 year cycle. <clears throat> so for five and a half years, uh, the, the activity, if you wish, on the sun, the flares and the sunspots, etc., uh, are go down in terms of energy, in terms of quantity, and sometimes the sun is actually almost dormant, it seems, uh, if you look at it through our, our telescopes. And then for the next five and a half years, it's, it's uh, generating up more energy. And so the 11 year cycle has been known to scientists for a long time, but a lot of people have been asking themselves, why? How, how does that happen? Is there a reason for it? We're not sure that we've come up with the actual reason, but uh, a lot of uh, scientists have now put together um, where the planets are circling, and in particular, Jupiter, Venus, and Earth. And apparently, the way that they, they're circling, and it's very cyclical, it's very predictable, where they'll be, and so on and so forth, is generating another enough pull of gravity to disrupt what's going on into the, in the sun. And it's an 11-year cycle. So we are part of the reason, we meaning as in those of us who live on the planet Earth, are part of the reason why the sun has this cycle, but along with some of the other planets, but in particular, Venus and Jupiter, apparently. Interesting finding. <clears throat> um, a number of years ago, I went to, to Starmus. Um, and Starmus was a, a one-week Atacama sort, um, astronomy get-together 
uh, in the Canary Islands. And Brian May was there, <laughs> and he's a, he has a PhD in astronomy, and he's also the lead guitarist in, with the Queen, the, uh, the group called, the musical group called Queen. And when I first saw him, I said, gee, I didn't know Ron Brescia was coming here. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, Brian is, um, uh, sorry, uh, Brian May is, is uh, a, a very well-known as astronomer and is uh, highly um, recognized and revered, if you wish, within the, the world of astronomy. And he uh, gave uh, and is currently explaining uh, what we're going to do in terms of trying to see how we can protect ourselves from some incoming asteroid, uh, maybe even comet, but let's go with the asteroids initially. Uh, so in 2021, we're going to launch a spaceship towards uh, one of the uh, asteroids out there in the, in the asteroid belt. And it'll land about a year, uh, a year later, 2022, and it's going to smash into it. And the idea is, can we smash it in, in such a way and at such a, a velocity as to deflect it? We don't have to deflect it very much. If it's coming towards Earth, we deflect it by one, sec one uh, degree or, or maybe even two. Uh, that's enough for it to miss Earth and not cause another uh, huge uh, massacre uh, of whatever is living on this planet. Um, and in 2024 and 2026, we'll send up two more spaceships to the same uh, celestial body to find out exactly how much damage did we do? Did we in fact disrupt its, its, uh, its, its trajectory so that it would be enough to miss Earth if in fact it was heading towards us? Fascinating thing, and Brian, um, <laughs> was explaining this and uh, uh, he's very much involved in this, this project. Uh, a lot of people have been um, wondering about Titan for a number, of what, a number of years. Titan is the only body uh, in this, our solar system that has, a liquid, that has liquid on its surface. In, in our case, it's water. In this, it's either ethane or methane. And uh, so Titan is, in fact, very interesting to us, um, as well as some other bodies, but in this particular. What, what is fascinating, though, is that you'll notice that there are some dark spots here and there. And people have been wondering, well, what are those dark spots? How did they get there? Why did they get there? And so on and so forth. And we now think that we, we've come up with a solution to that. If your child is, is out in the playground playing in earth and sand and everything else, and after a couple of hours, what does mom or dad say? Get into the bathroom, get in the bathtub, and we'll clean you up. And if that happens, once you drain the water, what, what is, remains? You've got a, a bathtub ring, right? And that's what is probably happening here, is that the liquid, whatever there is on Titan, uh, as it is evaporating, it is leaving the residue of the various uh, issues that were in that, that liquid on the side of the craters uh, that, it, that the water was located in. And so those dark spots on Titan is the result of, it's a bathtub ring, is the result of the liquid evaporating and leaving some residue behind. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, finally, um, we know that uh, every now and then there's a little bit of methane that, that, is, that comes out of the surface of Mars, but recently, as recently as in the last couple of weeks, uh, there's been a, a huge burp in the Gale Crater where um, Odys or Curiosity is located. And this was such a huge burp that it was actually picked up by Curiosity. And people are saying, wow, something happened here. What we don't know is whether this Methane burp is a result of biology or geology. You can't have methane spurting up if you have hot water hitting certain types of metals. And maybe that's what's, that's what's happening, except where does the hot water come from on Mars? Uh, if it's not, and if it's biologic, that means that there's some kind of life that is burping methane into, uh, into the atmosphere, whatever atmosphere there is on Mars, and uh, Curiosity is making us very curious as to what the heck is going on down there. But apparently there was quite a, quite a burp there. Yes, sir? 
I was reading one of the things they were saying is that they believe that it, one of the theories is that it's fossil methane. In other words, methane <coughs> was created by organisms that have been extinct for maybe a billion years or something, but that they were trapped in the rocks and every once in a while it just... It's burnt, yeah. That, that's possible, but if so, then that means that there was life at least. Um, but then the problem is, if it's still alive, then you get people who say, well, we shouldn't go there because we'll probably contaminate the environment. Well, you won't hear me say that, but anyhow, so be it. Okay, sir, Steve. Observing reports, I notice we've had a few clear nights. Anybody been out? Woo! Woo! There we go. Now we've got a few. We're going to have to high spot here to move along, but uh, I saw a rat over there, right? Oh, good. Uh, I've been very successful with my setting circle and my thermometer and all that. So I've been totally with John, and we're at my work, very light polluted, can't see anything. Mm -hmm. I looked up the Ring Nebula, set it, and there it was. Yeah. I'm very excited about that. It's a lot easier My to do. My has been picking off uh, messy objects like one after the other. Very happy about that. Okay. And the transit from where we were was just spectacular too. Okay. Uh, uh, just for those of you that are not familiar with it, uh, Rat modified his regular Dobsonian. He put an inclinometer which tells you what altitude you're pointing at, degrees above the horizon, 90 is vertical, of course, zero is horizontal and then your azimuth, which is your degrees away from north. And by looking up, and it's constantly changing, of course, as the stars are rising, the Earth is spinning. But if you look at the reasonably uh, uh, recent data from your phone, uh, it'll tell you what the altitude is and what the azimuth is. And you just dial it in with red scope, and as you say, you put in a wide field eyepiece, and it's right there. So for those who are looking for ways to uh, you get into a, a kind of almost a go-to, it's a push-to, but it's, uh, it will actually tell you, it's like setting circles for dogs. Yeah. Like it's a terrific idea. Yeah. More magnification, 17 millimeter, it gets a little sketchy, but at 17, it's pretty good. A little wiggle around and you're right there. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Anyone else? No? Well, I guess you're, you're talking late. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, this was here in Kitchener uh, with Marie and with her telescope, so she should really talk. But uh, uh, Jupiter, uh, the uh, what was it, Io and Ganymede uh, transits uh, and the shadows of the of the moons over Jupiter. Uh, we we've, we've uh, seen it with her uh, uh, four inch and ten inch dog. And uh, we had a terrible time to see the shadow of Io. But finally I said, well, I see some bulge or so. I don't know what I'm seeing. And then I uh, checked on the phone. And yeah, it was right in, uh, in, in uh, the belt. And you could not see it very well. But the moon was also right in front of the shadow because it was just one day after opposition. So the sun was right behind us to shine on the moon and the, and the shadow behind it. So, but even that one day already made a decision, uh, a, 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 a difference that there was an angle between the shadow and the and the moon. So that is amazing to see. And then uh, Ganymede came, and it was a crisp picture or, or image of of, uh, of the shadow, very clear black and very sharp. I was pretty Right, good. Marie? Yes, <laughs> For those that are, are listening, maybe not quite sure, uh, this uh, you look at the moon, and it's a, uh, or at Jupiter rather, is the moon's orbit, there are four main moons that are easy to see. Uh, when they go in front of the planet, they're called a transit. When they go behind the planet as they circle, it's an occultation. Somebody correct me if I'm clearing this up. And uh, when you see the uh, the moon cast a shadow on Jupiter. You'll see the shadow and the moon at the same time. What she's saying is because the the moon is in line with Jupiter and us and the sun, there's very little shadow from the moon uh, on Jupiter, so it's really behind the, the moon. Uh, 
but uh, you're saying that you can still pick it out, uh, but you've got to be kind of careful with it. Yeah, I got to see all three of them in my place. On the balcony, I can see the three moving the two, but you can see the colors, like the different colors. Yeah. It's quite nice. Io has to cast a smaller shadow, and it was going. The shadow was going right along the largest band. Okay. So you had you had to believe in your time. You actually have to believe, and occasionally you get to see it. Yeah, it was really playing tricks that night. But the getting was big. Well, we don't get triple shadow when transits and shadow, shadows uh, all uh, you know very often, a couple times a year maybe. There's one in July. I'll send a notice out. Yeah, thank you again for sending out the notice in the first place. Anyone else? Yes, Lily. You're not Lily. Sorry. Oh, yeah. You're not Lily. Go ahead. She's Lily? Yeah. No. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I don't think this will be able to reach. There you go, honey. Go ahead. So, um, today when, um, so I think Lily said that last week, um, I was in Florida. So, and I saw the Falcon Heavy launch. Oh. oh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want to talk wow. anymore. We're all jealous. Very jealous. And then, um, could I, you could see how, um, like the, the rocket boosters were coming down. Holy Funny. cow. <laughs> well, I hope somebody took pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've tried to use. I'll bet. Wow, congratulations. Uh, I wouldn't uh, go anywhere where uh, you'll turn your back on Rick. And <laughs> I'm horribly jealous. I was going to say, um, on the night of the transit, we were, while well, my husband was playing around with the telescope forever, trying yep. to, and we were looking, and I spotted. Um, Something moving, and it was Cosmos, a 1974 okay. Russian rocket. Oh my goodness! Okay. So we kind yeah. of that was a highlight for us. Okay. We got kind of annoyed with the shadow. <laughs> so we went inside and looked up the. Oh, there's a lot of sad. Well, you know, for most of it, you know, if you're out for an evening and you're looking, uh, you know, through a telescope, mm -hmm. it's, it's usually several times you'll see a satellite go through the field of view. There's a yeah. lot of them. Well, that was a that was a great. Okay. Um, well, um, me and uh, Marie like and Alan, we went out to Tilkers just recently, so we've been using that. It was fun. Thanks, Johnny. No, no, I'm mean, just saying, so it's up and running in a sense, right? Yes. Okay. There you go. I know that little girl's story was way better than mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Say that. <laughs> <laughs> Visiting my mother's in a home in North Waterloo for, with Alzheimer's. It's at the University Games and so on. And I happened to go up there uh, uh, last Friday morning at 10. I had a hard time getting a parking spot, so I was talking to one of the workers and I, and I told her, Well, what's the deal? And she said, You know, uh, Chris Hadfield's in the building. And he was, he was not quite as good as the launch, but close. Um, uh, he was speaking. Uh, or the uh, Institute for the Aging, yeah, what do they call it? Research Institute for the Aging. And they, they, were, they had been working with uh, uh, the action of the Kingdom, Dave St. John. Oh yeah, Dave St. John. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was, he was doing some um, <coughs> experiments for them. So Chris was there explaining they were working. Essentially, they are doing ultrasounds on uh, through a lab in, in, in France. So there was a woman there with uh, Chris Hatfield, and she was demonstrating. They had the fellow in France do an ultrasound, or set up his ultrasound, maybe his heart or something, and they showed his ultrasound in the room in Waterloo, and the woman at the keyboard was doing the ultrasound. So they were simulating how it would work in space. And he just happened to be there, and, and he spoke for about an hour and took some questions. Or, oh, uh, nice. so it was just so I, I didn't know. I, who knew? Uh, it was probably through the University of Waterloo that he was associated with. The RIA Institute, they're sending a bunch of stuff up, stuff up to the space station. Everything has to be labeled with special stickers on the special paper. Guess who got the print uh, <laughs> <laughs> If you want to keep the wrappers on that one, we'll come back. Right? Yeah, so other than that, uh, this 
16 Mercury, I need to die up, up at the hill in the west. It wasn't as easy as I thought it would be, but it's visible. It might be still visible now. Right. Very well, Steve and I were uh, spent several nights uh, at the observatory, and we initially started uh, imaging the Leo, Leo triplet. Uh, the problem was that you can start at 10 o'clock, and it's already pretty low, and by 11:30, 12, uh, it kind of disappears. Uh, so you have to take a lot of images. We have about two uh, two hours at this point, uh, which will uh, add more to it uh, as time goes on. And then we decided, well. Uh, let's go to some someplace else, and we went for M8 and M20, which is also very low. Uh, but we managed to to have a couple of hours of uh, imaging those uh, two galaxies um, and, until it went below the uh, the building that the school is located in. But um, anyhow, that was fun. It lasted until about two o'clock. Yeah, super. I actually got a couple of pictures there. Oh, Marianne, I was that. Uh on Manitoulin Island for the weekend. Oh. And I did not see one star. Nor did I see one I hope you brought enough for all. <laughs> it was soft right in. Oh, not really? Long. 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 I don't feel too bad now. <laughs> Great. Because Tilkers was actually very beautiful. And, um, uh, and one of the nice things about it is that Sagittarius is very visible from there. So I think one of the pleasant surprises for me at both Bayfield and Tilkers was that I can still try to move around in the Virgo group. So that those galaxies, um, it's, it's a bit tough because it's, it's, it's obviously descending now and uh, darkness falls you know, quite late. But I was still able to see some of those galaxies, including two called the eyes with my little six inch scope, which was nice. And so I, also I noticed like you can see M7 and M6 um, from Tilkers, which I think is great because they're, you know, they're pretty far to the south. And uh, so I noticed there was a little wee globular in, in Messier 7. And I could not pick that out. But I did have tons of fun in Bayfield with globulars. It was just great. And I, I did something I've always wanted to do, which was just go in the atlas and instead of, listing low viewers by what constellation I sort of picked out little areas like around M22 there's one or two and M28 there's a couple and M8 there's some so I was really happy with um, Missy 9 and Missy 107 there's a bunch of low viewers around around those objects and they were very visible in Bayfield and beautiful so okay. I, I, I I would like to go to Tilker's tomorrow <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, you you folks had a couple of days in Tucker. Yeah, yeah, we went, we went two nights. Well, because we couldn't, we couldn't waste good nights like that. Like, it was just after the spring that we've had, oh, yeah. you know, full and full. How would you waste that? Yeah. Yeah, that it was a little bit right. hazy the first night, but I thought the second night was better. Um, the second night was more steady because we had trouble um, with Jupiter, with our view of Jupiter, because we couldn't see. Europa's shadow. On, it was too unsteady. But then, remember how we picked that out? Like, the moons were all lined up, and one of them was close to Jupiter. And I, I said, you know, you would. Can we have a. Yeah, I just want to get a Marie, please. Go ahead, Marie. You, you, would, you would think it was, you know, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, but I said, no, it's not. It's Europa and Io. And we were, I was able to see the difference in the brightness of those two and figure out that it was Europa, and it was. But unfortunately, when it came onto the planet, you know, you can see this, you can see the moon nudging up to the planet, which is always a beautiful sight. But then, we couldn't really, I couldn't see the shadow. Yeah. Okay. So I think maybe we'll move on a bit here. Uh, yeah, after photos. Well, like Jerry was saying, there's a couple here. From, uh, there's uh, Leo Trio. Now, that's only 40 minutes. Okay, of uh, what they call clear filter. So there's no color in this one, just the black and white, but definitely uh, coming along. And we need some color desperately. So far we've got 10 minutes of blue. And that just kind of brightens up a few pixels. <laughs> it doesn't do a whole lot for us. Is that with the Taki? Takahashi? What, was, what scope was he using? Uh, this is the, uh, yeah, the Taki and uh, the 16803. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, the, uh, yeah, he's kind of slumming on that. <laughs> Are you working with Ron on that? Because I just posted one of his pictures on the Facebook page. On that. Leo Theo? Yeah. Okay. I want to take a walk. Sure. <laughs> and here's the M8 and M20 that uh, Jerry was talking about. Again, this is only about 90 minutes. I like to have a minimum of two hours and something like this, maybe even a little longer. But, uh, start definitely coming along. I don't and like it's sharp as a tack. I don't like it. Uh -huh. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Too many stars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where was it? Uh, at Jerry's Observatory at uh, just north of Maine. So. Steve, uh, Okay, well, this is the, uh, this one here is called M8 or the Lagoon Nebula, and then this is M20 or the Triffid Nebula. Uh, I don't have the ability to zoom in on this, would like to be able to, but Photoshop doesn't give it, not, sorry, uh, PowerPoint doesn't give you that option. But there are two Messier objects. Uh, they're uh, fairly bright. You can see them. M8, you can see with the naked eye. Uh, but with binoculars, it really jumps out at you. And the Triffid, I, I can't see it with the naked eye, but maybe some of you can. But uh, you can. it's right on the edge. You can see it? If you're in Namibia. Oh, in yeah. Namibia. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Good to know, right? Thank you very much. All right, and uh, day 10 sent us some pictures of the strawberry moon rising. Oh. I mean, I think these are through eyepieces. They're an eyepiece projection. But you can see some clouds. That's taken away for my iPhone, too. Oh, is this with your iPhone? Yeah. Good for you, man. Yeah, you yeah, start to, you're not looking through uh, 400 miles of atmosphere here. Yeah. yeah, nice, they very sharp light. All right, that's it for astrophotos. So if we can get, ask Ellen to uh, come up and give us a recap. <laughs> oh. uh, because, uh, well, yeah, we have to file the for but not for, um, not for Bayfield. And this is related to Bayfield Camp Circle, as it were. And when Red sort of said, well, Leslie does not like the cottages, and she is all uppity, so Leslie got all upset. And I said, but their cottages are so lovely. And then she says, yeah, but you are like the girl in house on uh, Little House on the Prairie. And so then I got the nickname Little House on the Prairie. So here I am now, courtesy of Sia <laughs> Leslie. She got me this. So just for mentioning Bayfield, here I am, Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> <laughs> You're to the next star party in Milbank. <laughs> Do that. Yeah. Anyway. I can't uh, pick which one you might be. Is this? EP. Yeah. Oh, maybe this is not here. Looks like they may. Oh, here it is. EP. Anyway, thank you. Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> it's Michelle. Oh, okay. <laughs> or Shelly. <Michelle. laughs> Anyway, uh, just just to continue about Bayfield. Oh, <coughs> microphone. That's good. My yeah, my embarrassment about Little House on the Prairie is not going to be recorded. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, basically, uh, Bayfield. I had some drawings, but I didn't scan them, and so you won't see them. But. I was watching in Bayfield, which is right at Lake Her Heron. Uh, very nice camp with very nice uh, campgrounds and cottages. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Even with a toilet and, you know, showers. Anyway, um, uh, it, it was very dark there. And we had one really good night. 
and I had a ball, as were other people basically, because uh, I had my 15 by 70 binoculars with me. And it was quite amazing. Uh, I could see things that I didn't think I could see with binoculars. And it was uh, an eye-opener for me. And uh, I saw the Whirlpool uh, M51 Galaxy. And uh, I saw M8 and M20. Uh, wonderful. Uh, M13, the globular cluster in Hercules. I saw stars. And, uh, and th that was amazing. I didn't think I would be able to see that. And what else? Um, well, the icing on the cake were M81 and 82. I just couldn't believe that I actually could find it. And this was handheld. This was before I had my Paragon parallel uh, um, uh, tripod. So uh, it was amazing that I could see those things. So. I was all chortling away, and uh, <laughs> Marie was chortling away behind her telescope, so we were all happy uh, of what we all could see there. It was, it was truly amazing. And uh, I would recommend anybody going to, Bay, uh, to go to Bayfield, because it is a wonderful, really dark area. So uh, especially not even that far from us. So, uh, and it is definitely better than Tilkers, even though I could see M81 and 82 and Tilkers just as well. However, not as pronounced as in Bayfield. So there is a bit of a difference. But Tilkers is pretty good too, especially because it's so close by. <laughs> so, uh, so highly recommended and it was a great, uh, great time. Now, uh, I had the pleasure to go to uh, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada General Assembly uh, in Toronto. And uh, yeah, so what is the Rusk GA? Can you eat it? Well, maybe not, but mind-wise I absorbed a lot of, uh, a lot of things there. Uh, it was four days, I went three. Uh, Jim Gates went uh, all four days. Uh, and here, uh, a short uh, overview and some highlights. Uh, it was held at York University campus in Toronto, and uh, uh, some people stayed there. Uh, Jim went back and forth to here. I stayed with friends in Toronto. Um, well, this sort of uh, speaks for itself. Uh, it was also a fun in conjunction with each other, also the uh, American uh, Association of Variable Star Observers were holding their um, annual meetings there. So it was very interesting. Unfortunately, I, I only attended one of the uh, AAVSO, even though I wanted to do more. But uh, I was, you know, there were so many things going on at the same time. And uh, the uh, symbol here is basically the twin uh, domes on the university there. And uh, of course, uh, the two organizations. Oops, I did something wrong. OK. Um, was it boring? Well, if you don't like lectures. <laughs> And then it is boring. Actually, when I was giving the overview here and was making it today, I was in Toronto yesterday, so I didn't have time, so I started it today. And uh, from my notes and, and the pictures and whatnot. Uh, I was, uh, Jim fell asleep while he was watching me doing it. <laughs> my Jim. <laughs> And I almost fell asleep while I was doing it, so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, it was, uh, anyway, it was about an hour. And in midstream, while I was making this presentation, I made it a little bit shorter and different than I was doing at first. I was making a whole report, and 
What I will do is I will sum up the presentations that were uh, given there in the fall or throughout the season. I will probably uh, give some of them and repeat them or we get the speakers. Um, it was very well organized, very good food. We were looked after very well. Uh, the, the food and the beverages <coughs> and support were great. Not for my weight though. <laughs> And uh, yeah, okay, I talk, talked about the AAVSO, which is a national organization in America. However, they are the organization for variable stars in the whole world. Now, of course, I got merely excited. Wow, there's comets here. <laughs> and they were basically displayed by, uh, this was in the room where all the lectures were uh, held. Uh, they were displayed by these uh, uh, um, projection lights and, and actually the pattern was this but then it would be projected like that so it's interesting so yeah comments Ooh, I was immediately uh, very happy uh, I have to tell you that I'm really in love with comets so that's why <laughs> um, the first uh, lecture that I attended was the Zooniverse by Dr. Clifton Johnson. Um, and this is a program that you can attend online and uh, to categorize a catalog uh, different uh, uh, kinds of things. It can be wildlife, it can be plants, it can be insects, or it can be objects in the sky. And I always had the feeling, you know, yeah, you have done thousands of people that are partaking and do you get uh, uh, basically uh, an overview of mediocrity because what do people know really you know <laughs> uh, well actually it, it, uh, it turned out that it is quite accurate people are really quite good at it and uh, basically they call it the wisdom of the crowd and Marie has partaken in uh, some of these uh, uh, galaxy uh, categorization and uh, I would uh, encourage people to partake in the Zooniverse uh, it's really quite amazing uh, or, uh, and I will talk about that uh, before we get Clifton to talk about it so just a, a, a not so good picture of the screen there <laughs> but uh, basically uh, categorizing this different uh, sorts of galaxies, if it's an ellipsoid or, you know, in what kind, in what class. And that's quite accurate. Now, there was another one uh, called Bright, uh, Bright Target Explorer Constellation, <coughs> uh, small satellites that have been launched in the sky. And, uh, by Professor Greg Wade. Uh, basically, they are launching six, uh, seven kilogram uh, uh, cube satellites, and uh, they will monitor bright stars and to see what their uh, surface is like, to see what the convection on, on the surface of winds are, uh, the tidal interaction between uh, binaries, and also searching for exoplanets. And at one session, they can do 30 uh, stars. It's a quite a wide field, wide field cameras. Um, and then there was the invention of outer space. You have seen all the, um, all of you, well, most of you probably have seen those pictures by uh, uh, Chesley Monstel. Monistel, I don't know how to pronounce it exactly, but and Billy Lay, who was uh, uh, an expert on uh, rockets from Germany, and they got together in the late 40s to uh, to write articles and books and do the space art, and that actually stimulated space exploration among the public. And Leslie is falling asleep already. <laughs> <laughs> It's getting boring, I can stop. <laughs> yes? I, I can remember uh, some of those, uh, uh, like popular 
advertiser uh, ones that were used to like the science fiction covers. Yes. Uh, you know, particularly uh, spaceships that looked like a B-2 rocket with the ladder coming out of the door out <laughs> and then down to the ground on Mars, right? Yes. There's a lot of that stuff in the 50s. Look, but you know, now it, now it happens. Look at the rockets coming back, uh, the boosters coming back. I mean, it's Mark Roger, uh, so it's, it's, it's wonderful. I mean, you know this yeah. picture most of you, so that is one of them, right? So uh, to, to, to show what outer space can look like and actually pretty good pictures that didn't always get it right, but uh, there's really some really good pictures of depiction what it would look like. Anyway, and then there was um, the science of planetary atmospheres, quite interesting. Uh, is they are trying to find uh, basically uh, really uh, looking at the atmospheres of different uh, places and moons and so forth here in the solar system to get a better idea of what exoplanets could look like and uh, uh, it, it will help us to uh, to uh, study or to understand the exoplanets better. The Cronin Observatory. Uh, oh, I made a t spelling. <laughs> I forgot the V, but anyway, the observatory. Uh, it uh, is a, a observatory at Western University. And the London Club, the London Centre, is using that, and they have regular evenings with it. Um, and uh, as, a, as an outreach to the London area community. So they were talking about that and the history of it. Um, this was all on Friday, by the way. Uh, the universe uh, uh, was, uh, is going to be revealed, we hope, by the uh, uh, James Webb Space Telescope, which is an infrared telescope, and uh, hopefully it will be launched at some point, but right now it's still delayed because they're very scared of launching it without uh, being absolutely 110% sure it will work, because it has to unfold, and it takes a long time, weeks, to unfold, and to have that dish ready, it's six and a half meters big. And uh, they are nervous about it because it goes in a wider uh, orbit around uh, the Earth. And um, uh, basically it cannot be served by any crewed mission coming from Earth. So it has to work and otherwise that's it. So um, Canada will be a good key in this, and, uh, and the, uh, Natalie Willett was, uh, yeah, is working on it too. So that was interesting. Uh, there were other lectures about Helen Sawyer Hogg, her life and accomplishments. Quite, uh, quite a woman. I mean, her, one of her better uh, astronomers. Uh, the memories of David Dunlop Observatory and Canada's role in the Manakwe tel uh, spectroscopy, uh, tes spectroscopic uh, explorer. And in the evening, there was a book launch of David Levy's uh, A Night Watchman's Journey. And uh, I think, uh, do you have any books left, uh, Jim, or are they all spoken for? Hmm? They're all taken. They're all taken, yeah. So Jim had some extra books, but they're all taken now. Uh, we were rubbing shoulders a little bit here. <laughs> so, I mean, Jim and I know David Levy for uh, quite a number of years, and uh, so it was good to see him. But he went, he went through quite a life. You know, he had a hard time at, uh, in his life, and it's good to read his book and how he came through all of it. And uh, then Elizabeth Reagan from the AAVSO, uh, I rubbed shoulders with her because I wanted to know if she uh, I still knew some buddies of mine in Holland uh, who were really avid variable star observers, George Camello and uh, Hank Veit. And uh, yeah, she, uh, she met him actually even, so that was quite, uh, quite a pleasure to, uh, to, to know because uh, they were good friends 
uh, as far as astronomers will be good friends <laughs> uh, of mine and actually I got my first telescope from George Camillo so uh, anyway she is a very very sweet uh, person and she is the main administrator and uh, of uh, AAV so um, well then there was something different and that was uh, the construction of the heavens, a multimedia interdisciplinary concert at an outreach event in the Victoria Center. They got uh, a bunch of musicians together to play William Herschel's uh, uh, compositions uh, because it's not being played very often. And uh, they wanted to, to show, uh, they showed uh, uh, the pictures and then the music uh, quite interesting and I wonder if we could do no, uh, something like that here. They are going to do a tour now, uh, so I want to say that they could not do that here or we cannot do that here with the symphony orchestra. Well, if you need contact numbers, names, and I know they're doing something with the math department at the University of Waterloo later in, the, in March. Okay. So for math and music, so okay. that'd be cool. Yeah, it would be cool because uh, uh, right now they are actually going to do a tour uh, next year uh, around all the centers and uh, uh, with uh, pictures of amateurs, uh, astro uh, astrophotography, and uh, and playing the music of William Herschel, which is actually it's not bad at all. It's quite beautiful music. And it's totally underappreciated, you know. So, uh, well, we'll see. It's it's another uh, another idea. Victoria, you mean Victoria, BC? Yes. Oh, okay. Weird. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought they could actually make music? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Who had thought they could do it in Kitchener? <laughs> Uh, then there was uh, on Saturday there was also poetry about astronomy, Shakespeare, and such uh, of the Elizabeth uh, times, uh, Elizabethan Elizabethan times with uh, David Levi, uh, our lady, and uh, music with Randall Roosevelt who played the flute. And it was quite beautiful, and uh, so we had a little bit of a combination of arts and science. Uh, well, and then we had a very generous uh, donation by uh, Rudolf Dorner, our Rudolf Dorner here, uh, to start the Dorner Telescope Museum. And I thought that Jim maybe would talk about it at some point later, or maybe now it will be talked about today by Rudy. Sure. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, here he is. <laughs> um, the, uh, the RASC Robotic Telescope Project um, uh, is, is uh, marred by weather problems and some technical ones too, I think, but I'm not sure. Normally, uh, there are about uh, uh, 250 whole nights, good nights of observing. Uh, this is in uh, California, the Nevada uh, 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 region. And uh, right now, in January, they had only one or two nights or something, which is totally unusual. So uh, the weather seems to have collapsed. Uh, it, it's all down on how many clear nights they get. Uh, so uh, they also don't know yet what they would charge. Uh, it was even something mentioned of uh, 80 bucks a year, now that would be good, I would go for that. Uh, but I don't know, they're, they're not sure yet, it could be way more, it could be whatever. So, but uh, very exciting, uh, the, uh, the telescope is a 16-inch uh, one, and uh, to get an idea, there's more telescopes in that uh, particular setup. Uh, I think, I don't know, Jim, do you remember which one it was? Was it this one? Or? It's the back, uh, it's just a sec. Uh, yeah, it's this the back one, left I think. corner there. Yeah, it's not the white one, it's the one behind Yeah, the, the black one. Yeah, 
They yeah. Call it the star starter telescope. They call it the starter telescope. Yeah. I would be very happy. With, well, no, it would be too heavy for me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, just an example of uh, what it can do. So that would be a remote uh, project. Um, they have what the 6D. They have a 6D on there, which is a Canon uh, SLR with a 200 millimeter telephoto, and they have been releasing those pictures. And you can go on the site and you can uh, have a look at the pictures that they download. Yeah, I recommend it. Uh, it's, it's been slow. I have no idea what's what's uh, an issue. But I'm, I'm not directly involved. Don't get me wrong. But yeah. I'm kind of I'm like you. I'm waiting to hear more. No, it is really because the, they are really upset. The weather has completely collapsed, and you saw the the, the graph of how many uh, clear nights they had over the years in that area, and now it's somewhere here. You know, it's it's terrible. So always happens when you get a new telescope. Yeah, <laughs> should know that. <laughs> Maybe it's only for a short time, yeah. right, Mike? <laughs> and then there was uh, something about things you may not know about the Apollo 11 mis mission. It was by Randy Atwood. It was um, uh, there were uh, a whole bunch of problems, and so they might not have landed if they wouldn't have just uh, solved it or ignored the computer problem and take over manually. So it was uh, it was almost a hit and miss uh, kind of situation. Um, and then in the evening there was another presentation, but uh, Jim might be able to tell you more about it because I missed it. Uh, I thought it was not nice to my friends that it would arrive again at 11 o'clock. <laughs> so I took off a bit earlier. And uh, it was basically about my Niels Armstrong. Um, and on uh, Sunday, uh, there was the uh, annual general meeting, and we have another new national board. I am not going to bore you with uh, names and so of people that you don't know anyway, <laughs> or maybe maybe you know some. But uh, I can I can write a report if the uh, if the uh, executive here would want me to. But I think Jim also took a lot of notes. Um, there was also a very interesting session about tips on running a center. Basically, uh, uh, they want to get a handbook together so that people or centers are not reinventing the wheel, as it were, of things uh, that other centers have gone through already. So we are looking out for that. Uh, and Jim, uh, in the afternoon, the sessions were split up a bit, so there were parallel sessions. That was a bit hard. Um, so Jim attended the youth at the RASC, uh, in the RASC session and I went to uh, an AAVSO meeting and I also went to the uh, workshop about light pollution abatement. Um, and the key is if you, do you have a question? Don't scratch my head. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, I hope it's not scratching your head that you're totally puzzled with what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, um, the key thing is forget about arguing about astronomy and all. Oh, boo hoo. We are missing our star, light, sky, and so forth because nobody gives a hoot. And uh, what uh, what basically has an impact is to talk about how light affects the wildlife, the environment. You know, migration of birds, uh, our circadian system that it, uh, makes us sick. Basically, the health is uh, involved. Uh, all these bright lights. And uh, also, you know, uh, bright lights make deep shadows, and actually, it's not safer <laughs> than what you would think, because uh, people can hide in shadows uh, if they want to do something fishy. Anyway, um, but we need an expert or experts on these 
particularly areas of uh, knowledge because we are just, we are not really experts on this. We just know. We are, I, I see us being the canaries in the coal mine, you know? We see how bad it is, what is happening with the sky and how bad it is getting polluted. And we sing and then we maybe don't anymore. So, <laughs> well, you don't want to hear me sing, but anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we, are, we need to, uh, I know we have somebody, but I, I, it's intermittent what is happening with that, so. Uh, here's the board, uh, and this is uh, uh, basically an experiment uh, done by some youth and uh, I have a little video about that too but I didn't bring that here. Uh, it's, it's basically the uh, 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 sort of exoplanetary uh, system. So it's very well done. We could ask them over here sometime, the kids. Kids did that. Uh, then some they also inclusivity and diversity. This was a bit of a controversial Thing. Uh, they would like to have a rest that looks like Canada. That was by Charles Ennis, he is on the board. And, uh, and the inclusive, uh, inclusivity and diversity team. Uh, I wanted to invite him to come over here. Jim and Clark sort of said, well, they probably wouldn't like it and doesn't have to do with us and so forth and so forth. Uh, I just, I missed most of that, so we'll have to go over that. See if it's yeah, good. yeah, and basically, it's okay. Even as a white woman coming into a room with mo mainly men, okay, if you're a female, it is a little bit daunting. Now I'm already originally introverted person. Yeah, you wouldn't believe that, but anyway, that is. <laughs> It's true. It's just great <laughs> I have learned that uh, to be an extrovert has its rewards. You stand up and you get run over. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I met this to go to meetings since I was 16. And the first meeting for me was um, a bunch of old men in Assen, in Holland, uh, mostly all. Uh, pharmacists and doctors, uh, you know, GPs, mostly. And, uh, oh, uh, Miss, uh, Miss Ellen, can you please uh, make the coffee ready? <laughs> and I didn't even know how to bloody well make coffee. But, <laughs> but I did it and I got things ready and, you know, but yeah, that sort of thing. Um, now, has it improved over the years? Yeah, I think so. But uh, and you see more women in uh, in, in in the um, in the clubs, but it is still still male dominated, white, you know. So, but what can we do about it? I don't know. Okay, you guys are all very welcoming. That is not the point. It's not the point, it's just to go into this whole situation is just hard. And I thought if we, if we invite somebody like him and find out, okay, maybe he has a solution, maybe he doesn't either. I think just to be aware is maybe a good thing, that's all. So, uh, so we, can, we can talk about that, I think. But we are not coffee drinkers. You're not coffee drinkers, <laughs> but I am. <laughs> anyway, well, and that was it. We had the banquet and the awards, and oh, fellows with ties. <laughs> so thank you very much. Microphone. Oh, yeah, we have a mic.
Is it? I'm afraid to. <laughs> afraid of these feedback loops. So it is working. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so what's up, uh, June? Uh, we've got a bit of a break uh, before our next uh, meeting, so I did uh, extend some of this stuff into uh, July, August. Uh, so first off, uh, planets. I'm not sure if uh, anybody's been following. Uh, of course you have. Uh, Jupiter. Jupiter's uh, uh, big in the news now. It's it just passed opposition, so front and center. Uh, you'll see a bit later. There's some of the uh, moon events and uh, and the great red spot. So there's uh, charts and charts of that. Uh, Venus is uh, in the morning, so it's uh, but it, it is coming around. Mercury and Mars just did a close little dance at uh, around sunset. About a week ago, and you can still uh, peek, peek them out. Uh, Saturn's coming around nicely, and and Uranus and Neptune are coming back into view as well. And you can see as we go later on in the summer, uh, same. Uh, well, Mercury bounces around. Venus is getting into uh, uh, conjunction with the Sun, but it'll pop into the evening sky from the fall. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn are sticking around. You can see Uranus and Neptune are. Uh, drifting into our evening skies, and we actually finally do lose Mars. So it's been slowly drifting uh, away in the uh, evening. So, uh, what's it all look like? So, inner planets this is a uh, mid June. Um, I've lost the Earth here, top dead center. Mercury, Venus, Mars. So, you can see that uh, we're starting to run away from Mars there. Uh, there we are in uh, July. Again, we're going to lose Venus and the Sun and Mercury. And then by August, Mercury will pop back up in the morning. Venus and Mars will go. And then uh, come June, this is the other planets. Again, we're top dead center there. You can see Saturn and uh, Jupiter are nicely lined up for us uh, this summer. But unfortunately, we're going to flip back a couple. You notice the declination on them is really low. So. So they are really, really low in the sky now. Unfortunately, that happens when we get any of the planets coming through in the summer, because uh, while the sun is high during the day, the uh, the evening, the, the ecliptic is quite low in the evening. The opposite happens in the winter, whereas the, when the sun doesn't rise high during the day, the planets are really, really high up. The moon, the hunter moon that uh, you, you get in the fall, that's why. Because if the ecliptic is low during the daylight hours, it's high in the night. And if anybody wants to come to my sixth floor balcony facing south, I have a beautiful view of Saturn and Jupiter like all night. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Well, I thought it was a Christmas Yeah. 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 Uh, inner planets, sorry, we're going to the outer planets, July, you can see they're still nicely lined up. Uh, Neptune is uh, coming into quadrature there, and then uh, Uranus is coming around as well. Actually, more to the point, it's not that they're moving, the Earth is catching up with them. So you can see we started uh, at the top and we're working our way around. Ah, what's it all look like? So this is uh, in the mornings, mid-June, uh, nice line up there, uh, Neptune, Saturn, Jupiter uh, and the moon at, at 4 a.m. Uh, going into July. See, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn is uh, moving into the evening skies. And by August, yeah, Uranus and Neptune are still up uh, at that at the wee hours. But you can see uh, Saturn and Jupiter are in the evening sky. Um, and now to the evening sky. June, as everyone has noticed, uh, Jupiter is up there. Pretty much by the lonesome, we've lost Mars. And then, but by July, you can see Saturn is joining up there in the evening. And come August, yeah, Saturn, Neptune, Jupiter are uh, all readily uh, uh, visible in our evening sky. So later summer, we're going to be able to see some of the bigger gas giant planets. So. All right, uh, as promised. Great red spot. Don't memorize any of this. We will put it up on the uh, Facebook page and the website. But general trends, you can see what happened in June there. 
Um, July, after opposition, we have a lot more opportunities to see the great red spot. Um, nobody mentioned that in the news about it untangling and unwinding itself. So, so there's been some observations and it looks like it might actually be undoing itself. Um, 400 years ago, Galileo saw it and took note of it. And, and recently, people have noticed that it's less red in turning a uh, paler pumpkin color. And it looks like it, uh, it this might be it for it. It's definitely shrinking. You say as area-wise, it's shrunk more than 25% just in the last few years. Oh, really? Uh, well, if anybody can get to one of it. You see those little uh, uh, black monoliths in the atmosphere were in trouble. <laughs> Actually, did, did you see that in the news? They did see a, a black vortex. Okay. I, well, I kid you, you not, this is real. <laughs> it was not in the shape of a monolith for anybody who's not a 2001 fan. But neither was the monolith started replicating it to come a little square on Jupiter. It was a big problem. You're a nerd. <laughs> You're right, and I forgot. <laughs> yes, I, I actually made my children watch Space uh, Odyssey when they were, I think, 10 and or something like that. It didn't go over well. They run away. <laughs> they, yeah. Well, they asked me, what was that all about? <laughs> <laughs> I still have nightmares about it. Well, I, I, I gave the book. It makes a lot more sense when you read the books. So. You really want to make me happy. I need to watch the original time machine. Yeah. No. <laughs> they haven't forgiven me for 2001. <laughs> uh, more great red spots. In August, you can see there's less opportunities, and September again. And mostly that's just because of the rise in set times, right? It's, uh, it's setting earlier and earlier each night. But anyways, like I said, we'll put this up on the, uh, the website and the uh, Facebook page. No, I'm just not going to put it. Okay. Uh, the Sir, moves. can you go back just for a second? Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> You have the great red spot between September 26th and 29th. I got a 26th, I got a 28th. So anyone who comes to Bayfield, there we go. <laughs> oh, is that what Bayfield's getting? Oh, awesome. Awesome. So uh, those are, yeah, those are, well, will all be reasonable times. So that's, uh, what is that, 840 and that's uh, 1020. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll see the sun's down around 7 o'clock that, that, those evenings. So, yeah. That's early enough for Mike. He can sleep by by midnight. Yeah. <laughs> so you have the to old stay folks need to make their. Hey, <laughs> 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 That was uncalled for. So shadow transits. So um, as uh, Jim pointed out, there was uh, a number of them. There's uh, there was your June one, Ganymede Nile. Um, you said there was another in uh, July, June? It's supposed to be a triple in July. No, oh, it might not be visible here, though. Yeah, so there is a great grand list of these things. Uh, this has been built for the ones that you can actually see here. So I'm not sure we can see a triple here. I, uh, I don't see it. There's a shadow transit. I haven't started looking into it yet. Yeah, I don't think that one's visible here. No, I think that, that was the one and only double we get this summer, believe it or not. Normally when Jupiter's uh, at opposition, we get a couple of them. But, uh, yeah, we got stunned out this year. Uh, moving on, in uh, August and again September, again, I said, like I said, we'll put this up on the website for you, but lots and lots and lots of them. Um, and yeah, uh, you were right. Occultations. Those are called occultations when it goes behind there. And these ones, eclipses, those are neat. So what you'll see is, if you can imagine when Jupiter is at opposition, the, the shadow of Jupiter is falling straight behind it, and you, you, just, you won't be able to see it. But um, when it's at quadrature, like a right angle, the Earth, uh, the Sun, Earth, and uh, Jupiter make a right angle, the shadow of Jupiter is actually slightly offset from uh, the way we're seeing it. So these eclipses are when a moon is just gonna go drift into the shadow that Jupiter's casting. 
And they're really quite neat because you'll see the Galilean moons there through your telescope and you'll be watching for one of these and say Io here, for example. Oh, September 28th, we'll be there. Well, um, the 28th is the, yeah, we'll be there. That's a Saturday night. Yeah. So at, uh, yeah, so at uh, 6.43 in the evening, well, that's a bit that's early, it's a bit early with the sunset, um, <clears throat> you'll see it pop out there. So anyways, what, what they look like is, is just this, this moon, like you see it in the, in the scope, just a little, little dot, just quietly doing its own thing, and then it's out. It, uh, it just winks out as it uh, goes into Jupiter's atmosphere. Now, sometimes there's a bit of a transition because Jupiter's not a rocky object. There's some diffusion through, of light through its atmosphere. But, um, but yeah, it's quite neat. They just they get winked right out. So, you don't have to wait for a shadow transit. The, the eclipses are cool, too. You won't see any of them right around now just because they're, like I said, at opposition. If I flip back to the uh, June, July dates, yeah, you, know, you, you see the odd one. Yeah, and, but but no, not a lot of opposition. You have to wait till later in the summer for that. Um, speaking of opposition, Saturn. So July 9th at uh, Saturn, well at opposition. So it rises at sunset and sets at sunrise. So it's uh, all night. And I was saying there before about the shadow. You see that you can't really see the shadow behind uh, uh, Saturn here. Uh, three months from now, when it's at the uh, quadrature, you'll distinctly be able to see the shadow falling on the rings behind it. That's what I was referring to when I talked about the, how the moons get eclipsed. And yeah, the rings are open up quite nicely now on uh, Saturn too. So, so that's a, it'd be a great night to go looking for. Saturn's always impressive. Uh, July 13th, uh, Jupiter and the moon are doing a little dance together. Uh, yeah, they'll just be uh, off on the 13th, hanging out there in Scorpio. Uh, you see Saturn off to the left there as well. And Ceres, if you're looking for a uh, big asteroid to have a peek at, that's up in the sky too, just off of the claws of uh, Scorpio there. And not to be outdone, Saturn goes hangs out with the moon uh, at 11 uh, in the, well, on July 15th. This is just what it'll look like at 11 in the evening. <coughs> Not too late for you, uh, uh, Steve. Get the better of <laughs> So, and this one is over in Sagittarius there, so. Um, trying to get my bearings. Oh, there's a trivet. And then, so yeah, the center. The center of your Milky Way is right there. That's where the black hole is. Not that you could tell. But. Um, July 21st, Neptune and the Moon. This one you're going to have to stay up late for because uh, Neptune doesn't rise until much later, but it's still miss a little dance with the Moon there in Aquarius. And then we have a meteor shower to round up the end. Uh, Peter, that's yours. Thank you. Yeah. This is free. It's a uh, Pyrex. Uh, I also have about four. Uh, this is just plate glass. Portable glass. I have, I think, four, 12 and a half inch in my trunk. Very <coughs> heavy to carry, but I didn't bring them in. And no, I'm not selling out of my trunk. So, anyway, if anybody wants one of those 12 inch ones, uh, come with me on the break, and I'll just add in a bag or something. Whatever. No. So, Peter, this is yours. Where once uh, that thing there, you can take it. And if, uh, if you want a 12 and a, 12 and a half inch, come with me during break. Okay, we're on break. Just a moment. Uh, we have a bag with swag uh, from the GA that uh, there will be an extra 50 50 price. So buy your 50-50 tickets because there is a bag with calendar and stickers and programs and a uh, pin like I have here. So there you go.